Welcome to this month's Preservation Association of Lincoln brown bag presentation. We're doing this without the brown bags these months, but we want to still be reaching out to you wherever you may be sheltering and sharing some of Nebraska and America's history with you. This month, oh, and I'm Ed Zimmer. Uh, you may remember me as the historic preservation planner in the Lincoln Planning Department. I'm now the recently retired preservation planner from the Lincoln Planning Department, but I thought I would do these to demonstrate I'm still around, and when asked, I may or may not show up. We're looking for Mr. Wright. I think we've heard that before. Um, this will be Frank Lloyd Wright, and we can look in Nebraska and find some traces, in fact, one lovely trace of Frank Lloyd Wright in McCook, I'll draw some more difficult connections to Lincoln, but most of this show will be finding the lovely, lovely houses of Mr. Wright in Michigan, where I had a special opportunity last summer and thought I would share those with you. So I am Ed Zimmer, Stork Preservation Planner, Emeritus. Mr. Wright, of course, um, had a very lengthy, very productive lifespan from 1867 to 1959, for over 70 years, produced uh, houses, churches, um, interior design, beauty throughout the country, uh, often regarded, especially by himself, as America's premier architect. And there was an important Lincoln, con Nebraska connection uh, to Wright. Uh, this couple, Harvey and Elizabeth Sutton uh, of McCook, Nebraska, uh, Mr. Sutton started as a musician, um, then organized a band um, that had quite a renown in Western Nebraska, uh, was recruited by the town of McCook to bring his band to McCook and established also a jewelry store there and was very successful in both endeavors. And early in the 20th century, um, Harvey and Elizabeth Sutton decided that they wanted to engage the rising young, although by now he's about 40 years old, um, architect Frank Lloyd Wright to design their house. And he draws up one of his new, um, gorgeous, prairie school type houses, low spreading horizontal, and this one built truly in the prairie in Cook, Nebraska. Um, and the Sutton's complete this house in 1908 when Wright was 41 years old. And the house is still there. This is a view from uh, as it appeared uh, in its first couple decades um, and still stands. Very beautiful house uh, in McCook, Nebraska, and the only documented Frank Lloyd Wright structure in the state of Nebraska, uh, one which we can rightly be proud. I'm going to, because this is Preservation Association of Lincoln, draw a much more tenuous connection um, of Frank Lloyd Wright to Lincoln, Nebraska. And we'll do that through a man named F.W. Little. There's his signature as president of the Lincoln Street Railway Company. Uh, this 19, 1891 um, stock certificate for that company. Uh, Little had been uh, in Sioux City, Iowa, comes down to Lincoln in the uh, booming late 1880s, early 1890s very active in street railway, very active in promoting baseball in Lincoln, and was a uh, sometime owner of the town team. And by uh, early 1890s, is ready to build a house uh, commensurate to his position in the community. And at the corner, uh, the northeast corner of 17th and G Streets, builds a fabulous large frame uh, neoclassic revival house, one of the very first built in that style um, in uh, Nebraska. Full-blown neoclassicism, does not look prairie school at all, um, but to build this grandeur of neoclassicism in early 1890s Lincoln, it's about 1893-94, almost surely Little had gone back to Chicago and seen the Columbian Exposition there, which had this vast collection of large neoclassical buildings, what they called the White City, surrounding a big lagoon, 
and he builds in Lincoln one of those white city neoclassical houses. Not the only one that's built in Lincoln, but the only one built that early because just as this is being built, there's a terrible economic um, catastrophe, the Panic of 1893, a nationwide depression. Uh, Little loses the street railway company. Uh, the next series of neoclassical mansions like this that are built follow about a decade later. But this one occurring at that 1893 uh, cusp, uh, sort of between the late 19th century and 20th century, is very reflective of Chicago. Uh, and Wright's employer in Chicago, uh, Louis Sullivan, has one of the grand buildings um, at the Columbian Exposition. Not in this style, uh, but uh, this is Mr. Little's house. Now what gives us our right connection is that after Mr. Little loses his house and his fortune in Lincoln, he goes back to Illinois where he was um, native, goes to Peoria um, and gets himself back on his feet financially very quickly. And by 1903 is ready to build a new house. And in 1903, Francis W. Little and his wife Mary engaged Frank Lloyd Wright to build their house in Peoria, Illinois. Uh, that house still stands, a beautiful private home um, in Peoria, uh, very much in that uh, brand new prairie school, uh, very, one of the early versions of that by Wright. Then the Littles um, decide for their health that Peoria is not the place and they should be up in the uh, Twin Cities area in Minnesota. And they move to um, Minneapolis and then by land on Lake Minnetonka and build in 1914, or complete in 1914, a second Frank Lloyd Wright house uh, that they call Deep Haven. Uh, that is this huge spreading house. There are the littles in that tiny vignette that I put at the bottom right. And this house sprawled across a uh, vast expanse of the lake shore of Lake Minnetonka, had the beautiful view onto the lake. Unfortunately, um, the house was raised in 1972, but major elements of it are uh, featured in major American museums, both in Minnesota and this living room at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. So while Mr and Mrs. Little's second Frank Lloyd Wright house um, no longer stands on the shores of Lake Minnetonka. It still can be seen for that, what that volume and expanse of, of Wright space looking out on a beautiful lake shore would have been like. What does that have to do with Lincoln, Nebraska, other than that uh, Mr. Little was so fortunate as to build and live in two Frank Lloyd Wright houses. Well, I want to take you back for a moment to their house, the first of their three houses, um, their house in Lincoln, uh, high neoclassical, about 1893. At that time, Frank Lloyd Wright was a young uh, draftsman, designer, uh, rising architect in the firm of Adler and Sullivan in Chicago. And by contract, he worked only for Adler and Sullivan but he had, a, he had a family, he was a man um, of a growing family, and at night he often produced designs for houses, what are called the bootleg houses. And the bootleg houses of Frank Lloyd Wright of 1892-93 or so, period when the house is built in Lincoln, were not prairie school. They were varied, they were fascinating, but some of them, and particularly this one, the George Blossom House on Kenwood Avenue in Chicago of 1892, is very frankly colonial, somewhat neoclassical, Palladian windows all around the first floor. House still stands. And on the back is a big bow, two-story portion that um, lights a, a second floor room and I think the dining room on the first floor. And you might, if you know our house in Lincoln at 17th and G, know it has this fabulous two-story bay window um, projecting from the southern exposure. Did Mr. Little have three Frank Lloyd Wright houses? Probably not. But this is not unlike Wright's work in that very early pre-Prairie School bootleg period. And we do know the Littles and uh, the Littles 
had a close connection with Wright, not just the two houses, but, but apparently were um, close clients. Never have we found any document that says this is a Wright bootleg house, but it's pretty fascinating that these folks, when they got back on their feet financially, uh, commissioned two known, documented, one surviving Frank Lloyd Wright house, one that survives in some of its major elements. So we have that bit of Frank Lloyd Wright connection to Lincoln, Nebraska. And that's all I can offer you on Wright in, other than the influence of Prairie School and, and his architecture we see in others' work. But we're gonna take a little trip now to Michigan, which I was blessed to be able to do uh, with my partner last August. Um, she's a knowledgeable Wright um, student and has for years found his houses um, and writes a letter ahead and says, could we stop by and see your house? Just take a picture from the outside, of course, not intrude on your privacy. And many people write back to her and say, oh, do knock on the door. And so we were so privileged as to see four Frank Lloyd Wright houses inside and out on this Michigan visit. I'll go through them in counterclockwise order uh, from uh, upper left and that'll be our chronological order. Uh, yeah, let's see, now we're gonna go, you'll see as we go. We're gonna start uh, with the uh, Meyer May House in Grand Rapids, Michigan, the earliest of the three, and this will be chronological. Uh, there is Meyer May in Grand Rapids, house of 1989, very high prairie school, uh, one of the real mansion, one of the gems of Prairie School, for a couple of reasons. The original construction um, for Mr. May, who was a, a department store owner um, and inventor uh, in Grand Rapids. House in beautiful condition today. It's been stunningly restored. And I'm gonna take us for a moment out of that house over to Racine, Wisconsin, where Wright had designed the Johnson Wax Complex in the late 30s, uh, one of his few tall buildings. Uh, fabulous complex, structurally uh, interesting throughout uh, with this great volume and those amazing mushroom columns. But focus down on the floor of this workspace where Wright designed and the Steelcase Company, who still build office furniture, built this great furniture designed by Wright for Johnson Wax. But what does that have to do with Meyer May House? Well, Johnson, the Steelcase Company, bought that house in Grand Rapids and restored it a few years ago to an amazingly exacting level. Uh, this is the kind of furniture in the intro in the orientation room in the house next door, before you get a free tour of this lovely house, uh, this piece of that Johnson steel case furniture is displayed. So now we're going to benefit by steel cases restoration of this beautiful Wright house um, and their pride. They use it as a show place. They use it apparently for sales meetings. Um, if you were trying to sell me something and sat me down to a dinner in this house, I don't think I could hold on to my checkbook, um, but they're selling to Apple or companies like that. Um, but they've done a beautiful job in the house we see behind it standing up, they bought as the orientation center and administration building, so they wouldn't have to put any of those uses in the main house. It is just a showcase top to bottom. So here we are in, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. The house had been extended. That lower view uh, is a, an addition that was put on the main house um, in later years and was removed in the restoration. So they went so far as to take off that major Wrightian but not original wing. Uh, they also did changes like took off the roof put steel underneath to hold that great cantilever, put the roof back on. I'll touch on some of the other amazing aspects of this restoration. Uh, so here we are looking um, at the exterior on this double corner lot, uh, 
grand, glorious house. See the, the oriel projection of that um, suspended bay window on the upper left. That's, you'll see that from the inside from the bedroom. Gorgeous uh, leaded glass work throughout the house. And just a beautiful condition today. Uh, copper work. This is an extension on the living room uh, with colored glass and a skylight above. And we'll see that from the inside in just a moment. Has some of that kind of Mayan feel that we see on some of the Prairie School ornament. And we'll see that throughout uh, the, some of the houses that I'll be able to feature. Now, very often Wright's entrances were deliberately understated. And here we enter the house facing that neighboring house in, in what's kind of a little compressed space. It's not actually tight, but just compared to what you will see as you step in through that beautiful door into this kind of living room. Um, and there we have not only that wall of colored glass, but even sky lit above. Beautiful furnishings they've replicated from early photos. Uh, where they could find the original pieces, they've used them. Where they had to, they've rebuilt them. We'll touch on that a little further. It's often commented that Wright built these houses for himself and not for his clients. Um, in the video introduction to this uh, beautiful tour, the esteemed architectural historian Vince Scully speaks about this house and points out that Mr. Meyer was a rather short man. The eye level of these windows in the dining room is his eye level, not Frank's, but the client's. Um, so I've put him there about at the right height. I'm not a real tall guy, but those, those, that bar, that mullion across would be about at my eye level. Well, this is Mr. May's right house by Mr. Wright, and it's Mr. May's eye level, not mine. Gorgeous glasswork above and in front of you, as well as on the desk. They've replicated um, or found many of the items of furniture. They have ideas of what Mr. May's books were, and he was very, um, he was a book lover, and we have uh, replicas or uh, I think even some of the originals of his books on the shelves. The fireplace has, between the uh, brick, uh, a glass insert covering the mortar. It's a reflective golden insert. It gives you that gleam between the bricks of the fireplace. Spectacular level of craft in the original construction and then in the restoration work. As we looked at the intro video of the work they put into this house, reminded me of the Indiana Jones movie when he's asking, who do they have working on the discoveries? And the government officials tell him, the best men, all the best men. Well, Steelcase had all the best people work on this restoration for truth and uh, spectacular work. Things like the carpet. These are very close reproductions of the original carpets that have been lost. They had photos, but they also had samples from the rug companies of the yarns themselves, and they rewove the carpets. They let you walk around on these tours on these carpets. They're brand new carpets. They're made of the best materials by the best men and women, um, but they got them very, very Right, R-I-G-H-T. Features like these wall sconces, um, beautiful in themselves, but also that pattern that they cast up on the wall is because there's a beautiful feature. This is my, my handheld phone up above that light looking down. You can't see this unless you're about 6'10" but you can see that pattern it casts on the wall and the ceiling, and the detail in this house is to that level. There's a room divider that separates the living room and a corridor from the dining room. Uh, 
apparently it had been painted over many times. They had it restored to fine arts standards and that beautiful um, hollyhock um, painting is by George Mann Nydecken, uh, who was an interior architect and worked on furniture and furnishings and decoration with Wright. Um, and this is his own work uncovered from the layers of paint over it. Uh, and there's a young picture of George Mann Nydecken. They often write in Nydecken, often worked on the furnishings and the interiors of these prairie school houses together. It's just a fabulous feature um, that one can find even, even on um, Snapchat. The dining room just behind that wall uh, has this built-in table. Uh, at the corners are four light stands with flower pots, um, all wired up. Apparently for certain events, they take away the flower pot and put a goldfish bowl there. Where do I sign up? Uh, beautiful setting, a fabulous tour. The docents are volunteers and they're, they're folks from Grand Rapids. Um, our, our docent was a uh, retired special education teacher, knew the house up and down, and the docents had a sense of ownership of the place that Steelcase owned it and they could have it when they wanted it, but it was really the docent's house and they presented it uh, beautifully to the tours. There's that built-in stand at all four corners of the dining room table. You have to sign up in advance to take these tours, but that's the only requirement. There's a little office space halfway up the stairs to the, to the bedroom level. Um, I think I would be able to work in this office. The master bedroom uh, has a kind of canopied ceiling um, up under that, that big roof. A fireplace above, a miniature version kind of the one in the main dining room, main living room. Among Mr. May's inventions were um, display racks for suits at, um, at men's clothing stores, which was his line of work. And there's one of his hangers there in the bedroom. There is that oriel window that projects out from the bedroom, kind of a seating space um, in the bedroom. Just to the right and left of that window, that little slot you can particularly see on the left-hand side is a window about an inch and a half wide and about maybe 40 inches tall. There's a little slot window like that on either side on this room and towards the back of the house as well. I think just because he could. the beautiful glass of that oriel window. Just beside there's a dressing room which has a smaller version of that kind of tented ceiling and the built-in light fixture there um, is built into that shape of the ceiling. One of the children's bedrooms towards the back and has a similar canopy. So these canopy beds are the canopy room not just the bed, um, and a doorway out onto an upper terrace. Looking at that house then from the outside and the kind of cantilever and why they had to put steel un under it to hold up that bold cantilever. Next we saw, so that, that that is our first, our earliest, oldest, 1889, 1808-89, um, proceeding over towards um, Ann Arbor um, and the Detroit area in Bloomfield Hills. We saw two houses, and these move us up um, to 1940, initially at the Affleck House in Bloomfield Hills. This is now a property of uh, Lawrence Technological University, Lawrence Tech. Uh, Mr. This is the Atfleck family house. Mr. Atfleck was a chemical engineer. Uh, and they lived here from building in 1940 
uh, into their death in the 1970s. The family then gave it in the late 70s to Lawrence Technological University, and they've taken beautiful care of it and provide an interpreter, tour guide, docent um, on appointment to this house. These are, the, the next three that I'll show are of the type that is a very, very broad type, are referred to as Usonian houses. And Wright was um, working at uh, preparing houses for a broader uh, range of clientele and, and broader socioeconomic clientele. This would have been a quite lavish house, but the next one I'll show was a school teacher's house. Um, again, the entrance is somewhat de-emphasized. Um, the doorway on the, on the right will be the main entrance in, but it has this, this lovely um, kind of sheltered carport as you approach the house. But this time, Wright's preferred site on which to design and build a house is some lousy piece of ground that nobody would put a house on. This one perches on the side of a ravine, but faces into that kind of rough space. So you come on it from, in some ways, the back of the house and the front is the family enjoyment of nature that the house is kind of embedded within. Um, each of these houses typically has sort of a logo or a, a, a specific motif uh, that's in much of its woodwork. Uh, and at the Affleck house, there is this, which the docent said was a stylized letter A for Affleck. And I said was a stylized ram running from right to left. And she said, maybe, might be. There's how we approach the house. Um, I'm now approaching the house at 6'5", five, not 5'9". Five, it's kind of compressed space, but it makes you feel pretty tall. And then there's the light coming from above, emphasizing right at the entrance. Uh, beautiful woodwork. These large wide clapboards are screwed on and in most places on the house, the screw heads are all on the same angle because we do this very carefully. We enter through a narrow um, brick hallway into a space that then rises up skylit and glass walled, a little exterior terrace just beyond those glass doors. The open windows on the right are at the bedroom and office level of the house, which is raised up from the main floor. We'll look, we'll look at all of that. Uh, looking towards that, there's a little narrow staircase going to be going up to the right that I'll show in a minute, but this is what apparently was first uh, Mr. Affleck's office looking onto this kind of center space in the house. Wall of storage uh, along one side of that, that skylit room. And if we look at the very leftmost um, of these double doors, that's where the powder room is, just as wide as one of those, um, half of one of those openings. There's a kind of a well space with glass floor uh, in that entry space, and originally a little stream ran right under the building, um, sort of a miniature falling water feature in this house. It's kind of a dry stream, I guess, unless it rains real hard today, but we'll see that from the outside as well. But we're looking down into that feature of that central space and beyond into the living room with its glass wall. Uh, there's the Affleck Ram and that feature appears again and again in light fixtures and piercings in the walls. And then here we're in the uh, main family living room. We see the kind of simple uh, plywood furniture that, that was designed for many of these houses and appears throughout this house. Um, and also the right module that he would have a certain unit um, that he would design the house around uh, and his concrete floors would, be, would ha reflect that module, the windows, elements of the ceiling, inside and out. He would carry a unit uh, defined, that he had defined for that given house. The walls, ceilings, and exterior clapboard are very similar. Here are the Afflecks, Gregory and Elizabeth, the only families that lived in this house until their deaths in 1970, and their children donated it. Lawrence Tech in 78. 
they're sitting on that on that very furniture that is in that living room today. Fireplace, um, still a key feature of the living room in each of these houses. And there you get a good look at that simple kind of furniture on the lower right. Fireplace quite a lot larger than it looks. And there in the middle of this view is Janice Means, our docent. She's a retired engineering professor from Lawrence Tech and gave us a fabulous tour of the house. And she invited on her, her left, our right, she invited along um, Elena, and I'll introduce her. Elena is the docent at another fabulous house in Blooming Field, Bloomfield Hills. And we got a lovely tour of that house as well by just the fortuitous event that Janice had invited Elena along to see Janice's house. And Elena returned the favor by showing us her house. Those windows open up on this lovely terrace, which sits then perched right on the edge of the um, kind of ravine space and the little woods, separated by um, dozens of yards, but um, hardly believable from a major arterial street um, that comes from Detroit up into um, this suburb. And it feels like we're in the middle of, of the wilderness. We're not quite in uh, falling water wilderness, but actually we're right at the edge of a major American uh, metropolitan place. And this house is tucked lovingly into uh, space you pretty much can't build on. So it stays there open in front of the house. Drain pipes draining the roof out beyond the terrace. All in copper. Lovely open um, seat seating area out beyond the covered roof. And we're looking then at the bedroom wing that goes up into the hillside beyond. And the beautiful stepped clapboards on the wall. Now we're, Pat and I are up at the office level the, um, of the house. The stair, the, the stair hall is the narrow space to the right. And that's what it looks like, a very compressed space, sort of like that compressed entrance, connecting then the, the more public level of the house to the private level up above, cast concrete stairs rising there, and this uh, one of the bedrooms. And not the tented ceiling anymore, but still a very lovely uh, ornamented ceiling um, by this patterning of the, the wide boards, brick walls, to the left of the bed, we see a, a, a board along that brick wall. That's to, instead of having a um, interior wiring uh, with these brick walls, that little board provides a chase for the wiring uh, within the, on the face of that wall. Back to the stairs, because we're gonna go down, stop briefly at the kitchen, um, just off the living room. And that little space between the stove and the counter I'm not gonna bang into anything because there's actually a staircase down. Um, and built into that staircase, um, some storage drawers. And then there is a space under the house, um, partial basement, um, boiler down there. And then we also see stairs up to a, to a roof level for roof maintenance and down to the ravine level behind where there's a seating area under that great spread of the terrace and living room. The house perched up on its uh, brick piers. And you can see where the little stream uh, ornamented with the boulders and pebbles uh, had run under the house. And there, uh, Janice and Elena are coming around uh, beneath that overhang. You can see how wide that comes out, the terrace up above the spouts of the roof drainage, and then nature into which the house is embedded. Looking up the bedroom wing, uh, stairs down from the terrace outside that first glass enclosure to the laundry room door on the left. Probably lovely to step outside on a wonderful spring day and go down to the basement to your laundry. Might not have been quite as, as felicitous in the winter, um, but that's where the laundry room is. 
and Pat and I are standing on that lawn just outside that wing of the house. Fo photo by Janice. The house in its setting and a little further back across the ravine to really that, that face, the family face of the house towards that beautiful natural setting. Just about a mile away, so I've added number three in Bloomfield Hills is the Smith House. We didn't think we would be able to visit the Smith House. We hadn't gotten a response to past letter, but we didn't know that we were supposed to be writing to Cranbrook, Cranbrook community. They're the more recent owners of the house. And so in the upper right is the Melvin and Sarah Smith House, also in Bloomfield Hills, about a decade later than the Affleck's house, although they'd commissioned the house in 1941. Uh, we'll go a little more into the family here because it's a, a fabulous story. You can see a pond. This house faces what had been a wetland and now is a little pond feature. And while we were there, the deer were as well. We we're just mile a few miles north of the city of Detroit here. Another car car carport sort of feature at the entrance and a fabulous right gate on the driveway. Uh, we'll step closer and go through that entryway, one of those hanging right light fixtures hammered up of, of a board and, and plywood. And the entrance with at the bottom right his signature tile that he would provide. And this house he apparently was very proud of and very fond of the owners. And I'll tell you their story, um, see why he was so fond of them. Uh, the entrance to the Smith's house and the living room. Uh, there is a kind of signature cut out here. Um, I don't see any S for Smith here. Uh, and there one of the right corners where he liked to miter two pieces of glass together right at the corner of a window. And here's Elena Ivanov of the Cranbrook Center for Collections and Research. She's the docent for this house. Uh, Cranbrook has owned the house since 1917. And fabulously, it's still, since 2017, and fabulously, it still has the Smith's furnishings because the family, after the death of the Smith's, uh, family uh, de gifted the house to a foundation and then on to Cranbrook who've cataloged everything in the house and Elena knows it like a family member and she's not a tall woman but she steps inside that house and she fills it up and she fills it with the Smiths and it's a wonderful place to visit. Uh, looking out through the, the glass wall towards their pond the house features the artwork the Smiths collected over the years, largely from Cranbrook artists and students. Um, so it's richly decorated. The Smiths were school teachers. Um, and as a graduate student in 1939, uh, Mr. Smith saw falling water in a class and said, I want a house by that guy. And in 41, uh, the Smiths visited Wright at Taliesin commissioned a house which they could not afford, even though this is a very modest priced house, and started saving their pennies. Bought this swampy site a few years later and set about trying to afford to build the house. Wright visited it. Um, Smiths occupied it in 1950. They built it in 49 and 50. Um, they served as their own general contractors to save costs in building it. Their combined annual income when they built this house was under $3,500 a year. They were public school teachers and they were saving every penny to get this built. Um, Wright visited them in 51, 53, and 57. Um, they were said to be among his favorite clients and I think they were as willful and as resourceful as he was. And you can see when they first move in, they don't have furnishings. They just barely could get the house built. Uh, it is well documented that when they had it built but the windows weren't installed and they were down to their last $500 and they had thousands of dollars of windows to put in, they were visited by a young man uh, named Taubman. 
who was a rising star in Detroit real estate, and he wanted to see this right house that was being built uh, nearby. And they said, and he said, the window's coming soon. And they said, well, no, we've got to, got to save a bunch more money. We've only got five hundred dollars. He said, oh, I think I give me the list. And the windows arrived, and a bill for five hundred dollars. Taubman had paid for their windows. Now this is their son, um, who instigated the gift of the house to Cranbrook. The more modest fireplace, um, even Elena couldn't stand up in this one. Um, and some of the artwork that they built into the house, very richly um, featured. The kitchen, often Wright would design a little folding door to seal off the kitchen from the dining room. Uh, this still has its folding door, but they've also turned it into a work of sculpture by one of their favorite artists. Uh, and so the house really reflects Cranbrook and the Smiths as well as Wright. Um, the house had one major modification in 1968 um, by architect William Wesley Peters um, of the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation. And he enclosed a back terrace, open terrace, into a um, enclosed um, sunroom type space um, and also created this dining room uh, through that work. This some of that exterior, that specific ornament they use on this house into a screen for the dining room, and another one of those light fixtures hanging back in that now enclosed. And that is right in a corner. We just see the seam of those panes of glass meeting at the corner. No, no uh, mutton or mullion there. Outside view of that space, so beautifully, an alteration, but beautifully done. Very, very sympathetically done. And a view into their pond uh, from a back seating area where the module of the floor has been carried out to the outside uh, throughout. One last house, uh, and this is the last of the four, the last built of the four, and it's in Detroit proper. Um, it's called the Turkle House. 1956, uh, three years before Wright's death. Um, it's also Usonian, but it's what's referred to as Usonian automatic um, and features concrete blocks in something like two dozen patterns of blocks all off the same basic module, but some of them windows, some of them ceilings, some of them walls, um, and th that module spilling out and expanding into forming the whole house. Um, Original owner was um, a parking lot magnate, uh, Mrs. Turkle from Detroit. Um, apparently in the course of construction, she needed more room and had the back wing put on by right at the time it's being built. So it's an L-shaped house today, but that fabulous glass is the living room and then a balcony over the um, first floor and off to some of the bedrooms onto a great garden space. This is a private home. We were very blessed to be able to visit this um, by the current owners. Uh, and we were able to take um, Janice along, who hadn't seen the house uh, and is a uh, very knowledgeable Wright um, scholar as well. And so it was a treat for her. Entering in through a narrow passage like we've seen in other Wright houses. And here we're in that fabulous space. And there's Janice and her husband, Joe. And the owner, Norm Silk, one of the two owners on the left. They've decorated it beautifully. Uh, I would, in the course of this tour, I suggested that probably it had never looked this well under any other owners as the current owners and their, their fabulous taste. See how the walls, while well, e each panel switches the orientation of the grain reflects the same module as the floor, the windows, the ceiling. Built-in furniture. The owners are florists, so those are August Michigan peonies on the table. I didn't know there was such a thing as August peonies. I'm a Nebraskan. Um, balcony over the fireplace in the living room, and then a hallway um, that leads down to the kitchen and other first floor service rooms on the right. 
much more modest sized fireplace. That hallway with built in cupboards, those open up in kind of a clamshell pattern to, to hold the, the uh, dishware of the family, and then open on all those doors, each one of those opening onto the garden space. Doors out to the garden, kitchen would be off to the left in that hallway. Staircase coming up is the same cast, con cast in place concrete. And then we look out from that balcony onto the fabulous dining room or living room space. Similar hallway and quite generous in its proportions. Uh, serves the second floor with bedrooms and offices on the left, staircase on the left, and on the right, those doors again opening out onto a balcony for the they will open that whole space onto the garden where the balcony looks like this. And what we've got in those rectangular modules is a half module of the floor or ceiling module. And then the garden features that same kind of burnished uh, concrete and the same unit pattern as inside. From the garden looking back at the house, this wonderful overhang and this sh um, shadowed space um, above those doors. And Wright visited this house um, in his late years um, on, during its construction. So very generous of the owners to grant us this private tour of their private home. Um, there's Norm Silk on the right and Dale Morgan on the left florists with a couple of fabulous flower shops in the Detroit area. And they are proud and very, very capable owners and stewards of a fabulous Wright home. They're very generous in allowing us this visit. And that is where we found Wright, a little bit in Nebraska, but mostly in Michigan and many other places around the country, but great adventure and a very tour that I hope you enjoyed any fraction of how much I enjoyed it. Thank you.